Leah Badstone is a musicologist at Hunter College, right here. Her research uh, concerns the intersections of music and social and political change with a focus on San de Sieco, Austria, and 20th century Ukraine. Her doctoral dissertation on German, on uh, Gustav Mahler and Friedrich Nietzsche was completed at McGill University in 2019. Her research has been um, supported by a Fulbright Mac Fellowship in Vienna, the Tara Shevchenko Foundation of Canada, and by the Center for the Humanities at the Graduate Center, CUNY. Professor Pat Stone has presented at several international conferences, including the American Musicological Society Annual Conference, uh, and also uh, conferences at the International Biennial and North American 19th Century Music uh, Connections there. Also, uh, the 2019 Symposium between Kyiv and Vienna, hosted at the Viennese Institute uh, der Musikalischen Wissenschaft. She currently serves on the editorial board of Artistic Culture, uh, Topical Issues, the scholarly journal of the Modern Art Research Institute of the National Academy of Arts of Ukraine. Let's ask her to our paper topic, uh, con uh, contracting a national, uh, constructing, excuse me, a national canon, Ukraine's musical landscape after 2014. Let's give her a warm welcome. <laughs> Volodymyr Sorenko has conducted the National Symphony Orchestra since 1993, 
and Hobart Earl has been directing the Odessa Philharmonic since the country's independence in 91. By contrast, the directorial staff of the Lviv Philharmonia has seen significant turnover in the past 10 years, making it difficult to determine whether repertorial changes are based on a social and cultural shift in Ukraine or should be attributed to changing conductor preferences. My discussion, therefore, of Lviv's role in the post-2014 construction of Ukraine's musical self-presentation examines the developments of the city's festival culture, for which it is well known. Scholars studying Ukraine in the fields of history, literature, and theater are increasingly interested in and devoted to the, to the rejection of an ethno-national and monolithic view of Ukrainian identity, focusing instead on the region as a unique melting pot where multiple currents meet, as well as a historical and contemporary site of intellectualism and experimentation. My work contributes a musicological perspective through identification and discussion of three emerging trends in prominent orchestral repertoire. The increasing presentation of Ukraine as informed by the country's unique transnational history, a fierce promotion of new music, and the role of Ukrainian orchestras in providing exposure for a variety of musical traditions that have intersected within its borders. <clears throat> in March 2013, less than a year before Naim's call to Maidan, the National Symphony Orchestra of Ukraine programmed a concert dedicated to the 100th anniversary of the birth of Tikhon Kandakov, a Russian composer who served as the General Secretary of the Union of Soviet Composers for over 40 years and was responsible for the persecution of artists such as Prokofiev and Shostakovich. It's surely no surprise that in the years following Maidan, figures like Kandakov are conspicuously absent from orchestral programming rosters. Rather, what's somewhat surprising is that instead of turning towards a singular ethno-national tradition of Ukrainian music, the performance repertoires in Lviv, Kiev, and Odessa all show a diversification of the composers and compositions performed, one based on the country's transnational history as a meeting place for multiple cultures, religions, and ethnicities that include Ukrainians, Jews, Armenians, Crimean Tatars, Austrians, Poles, as well as Russians. As, to be, as is to be expected, an increase in the performance of Ukrainian composers can be observed in both Kiev and Odessa. However, Russian composers have also continued to be performed in both places, where instead a shift in the balance between Russian and Ukrainian repertoires has occurred. An examination of the programs over the past 10 years shows that, num that the number of works by Russian composers included in a given season has remained largely the same, while the performance of Ukrainian composers has increased substantially. The representatives of Rus Russian music have been limited to well-known Russian masters, Tchaikovsky, Rachmaninoff, Mussorgsky, but the Ukrainian composers frequently performed are not the tried and true figures of Ukrainianness, such as Dmitro Bortnyansky and Mykola Lysenko, who have escaped the fate of many Ukrainian artists who are often incorrectly <laughs> designated as Russian. Instead, the representatives of Ukrainian music are largely living composers, including young artists, experimental composers, and several women. While this balance reflects Ukraine's ethnic history in laudably non-reactionary terms, acknowledging Russia's presence in Ukraine's truly mixed cultural heritage, the Ukrainian contingent clearly represents a kind of freshness and progress. Along similar lines, the number of works by Jewish composers has become a regular component of the repertoire with an increase in works on Jewish themes composed by Ukrainians and Jews alike. This includes a large-scale commemorative event of the 75th anniversary of the Babin Yar Massacre in 2016 in Kyiv. Prior to the events of World War II, Ukraine was home to one of the largest Jewish populations in the world. Necessarily, Jewish Ukrainians have contributed widely to Ukrainian culture and vice versa. While Ukraine is frequently accused of rampant anti-Semitism, Ukraine's far-right Svoboda Freedom Party has seen far less success in parliamentary elections than similarly inclined political parties in Austria, Hungary, France, and Germany. And it's probably worth mentioning also that the current president is well known to be of Jewish descent, Jewish Ukrainian descent. Yefim Stankovich, one of Ukraine's most prominent living composers, has written multiple works on Jewish themes, though he himself has no known Jewish heritage. When I interviewed Stankovich last summer, I asked him what inspired these works, and he noted that his Kaddish Requiem for Babin Yar was commissioned by Ukraine's first president, Leonid Kravchuk, in 1991. Kravchuk apparently took it upon himself to initiate a national memory of the event. But with the exception of the post-Maidan performance in 2016, the National Symphony records do not show a performance of this work in the last 10 years. 
The Post-Independence Commission, combined with the post-revolution performance, suggests the importance of this narrative in moments of Ukrainian redefinition. Odessa's long-standing Jewish community has also played a role in the city's orchestral programming. Even before the events of 2014, the orchestra consistently programmed the works of Jewish composers. What has shifted is that in the Soviet era, that in addition to the Soviet era composers of Jewish heritage, whose works are regularly performed, including Isaac Dunayevsky, Isaac Schwartz, and Mikhail Kuss, the number of Jewish composers from beyond the Soviet Union has increased, with recent performances by Leonard Bernstein, whose parents were from Ukraine, actually, and Ukrainian-born Israeli composer Emmanuel Val, as well as Ernst Bloch, a Jewish composer whose own life was marked by a movement between nations. The performance of Stankovich's symphonic poem Hanukkah in Odessa in 2015-16 is the first time the work this is the first time a work on Jewish themes by a Ukrainian composer has been performed in the last 10 years. And here I'm talking about the, the Odessa, specifically Odessa's repertoire. In addition to increasing acknowledgement of the central role, role of Ukraine's Jewish population, um, the Odessa Philharmonic also performed Crimean composer Alamdar Karamanov's Crimean Overture for the first time during the 2014-15 season. Ukraine's celebration of its Crimean history became most prominent with Jamala's 2016 win at Eurovision, but has continued with annual celebrations of the Crimean Tatar population. And this is a photograph I took in Kiev last summer during um, a period of celebration of the Crimean community where half the city's flags were changed out from the national flag to the Crimean Tatar flag. In Lviv, the relatively new festival, Lviv Mozart, reveals an increasingly multi-ethnic multi view of Ukrainian history from the perspective of the country's western region. The festival itself, which began in 2016 through the vision of Ukrainian conductor Oksana Lviv, ins is inspired by the youngest son of Mozart, Franz Xaver, who left Vienna as a teenager and spent 30 years in what was then Lemberg, part of the Austrian Empire. The German-speaking Austrian-born composer has come to be celebrated as the Lviv Mozart, playing a central role in the city's musical history. Over the past three seasons, the festival has also expanded to include other overlooked residents of Western Ukraine. The most recent festival in the summer of 2019 was organized largely around the recognition of the German-speaking Jewish writer Josef Roth, born and raised near Lviv. In 2019, Lviv Mozart intersected with another of the city's long-standing festivals, Lviv Klezfest, by programming a concert of klezmer music immediately following a concert of Galician symphonic works, a mosaic of the musical style not unlike Western Ukraine's own multi-ethnic makeup. And there's the, the two performances side by side. Historian Mayhill C. Fowler's research has offered ample insights into the truly transnational character of Ukraine's cultural and political history. In her article, Beyond Ukraine or Little Russia, Going Global in Ukraine, she argues that rather than focus on a Ukrainian culture and the ethno-national implications that come with it, much more illuminating and fruitful is to look at culture in Ukraine, a historical gateway between East and West and the most diverse of all Soviet republics. For example, Fowler's scholarship in the field of theater studies reveals that out of 48 theaters in the Ukrainian SSR, two were Moldovan, seven Russian language, 33 Ukrainian language, two Yiddish, and one each in the German, Polish, Bulgarian, and Armenian languages. A statistic that she notes does not include the Tatar theaters of Crimea or the Polish and Yiddish theaters that were at the time located in Poland but are now part of Ukraine. As Fowler cites, Georgi Kassianov and Philip Ter's work advocates for a pivot in the understanding of Ukraine from an ethnocentric history to a transnational one. As they point out, this ethno-national way of writing history, continuously supported and directed by the various governments of Ukraine during the 1990s, came into conflict with prevailing cultural and political realities in Ukraine itself. Its diversity of cultures, religious denominations, languages, ethical norms, and historical experience and memory it would seem that someone with the nation's various symphonic it would seem that someone at the nation's various symphonic establishments agrees. The Ukrainian literary scholar Mark Andrichik, who spoke yesterday at the Graduate Center, has focused much of his career on the period of Ukrainian literature developing from the end of the Soviet Union through the early years of independence. His book, The Intellectualist Hero in 1990s Ukrainian Fiction, has provided a framework for understanding another trend 
that can be seen in the orchestral programming of the past five years, a focus on new music, which of course this weekend's festival aims to highlight. The appearance of the intellectual as a kind of celebrity, what Andrzejczyk calls the swashbuckling performer in the writings of Yuri Andukhovich, demonstrates the emancipation of Ukrainian intellectuals from the hermetic existence they experienced during the Soviet Union. In music, too, the importance of intellectualism appears to be a significant priority in the contemporary programming of even the canonical ensembles, not to mention the appearance of dozens of small-scale contemporary music ensembles throughout Ukraine. Odessa and Kyiv both include significant portions of contemporary music in their annual programs, a trend that's been increasing since 2014. Not only are many of Ukrainian composers' programs still living, but orchestras have also included in their repertoires the works of living composers from other parts of the world. In Kyiv, the French composer Claude Bowling, um, Christophe Penderewski of Poland, and China's Tang Dun were all performed as part of the 2018-19 season along with the works of six, six different living Ukrainian composers. During 2017-2018, Odessa pro programmed the works of the American composer Charles Halka, the Tajik-born Israeli composer Benjamin Yusupov, as well as seven living composers from Ukraine, while the 2016-17 season included <coughs> compositions from living composers Emre Arachi of Turkey, Greece's Theodorakis Mikis, and Mexican composer Arturo Marquez, among others. One wonders how the representation of new music in any given season of the most visible and long-standing American institution compares. Uh, for example, cursory examination of this season at the New York Philharmonic does feature uh, the program, the Project 19 works of 19 living women composers, but that is largely an outlier if you look at the past two years of programming. While an awareness of living composers does not necessarily imply an appreciation for contemporary music, other perspectives illuminate the proliferation of challenging contemporary works in the Ukrainian repertoire. The festival culture of Lviv has always been characterized by experimental new music, such that a festival rooted in tradition, such that a festival as rooted in new tradition, a festival as rooted in tradition as one named for a member of the Mozart family, expends a significant energy performing the new music of young Ukrainian composers. <coughs> Першою зачіпкою до створення такого концерту інсталяції ПОПО були не твори фортепіальні Франца Ксавера Моцарта, які ніби стали його основою, а були, власне, ультра унікальні, цікаві твори молодих українських композиторів, наприклад, Дубава Сидоренко, оцей твір дизайн для скрипки електроніки. Білий ангел для на слова каленця для голосу і електроніки. Дощ, який пролунав останнім треком. festivals will leave, many dating from the early 1990s, include the Virtuoso Festival, Contrast, this new music festival, Vox Electronica, the Lviv Jazz Fest, and the Festival of Early Music, which frequently juxtaposes old works with very new ones. This summer, this past summer in 2019, for instance, Lviv's Festival of Early Music featured several concerts that combined the repertoire of living composers with canonical representatives of the Baroque periods. Now to go back to this slide, yes. The most striking example was a concert by the Kyiv contrabassist, Nazar Stas, who composed his own fusion work that combined an arrangement of Bach's solo cello music with works of Stefano, Scandinibio, and Salvatore Schirino. Not only is the performance of new music an essential component, if not the organizing principle of many of these festivals, but their variety and nearly consistent presence throughout the year demonstrates a local interest in sophisticated and challenging repertoire. According to the Lviv composer Ostap Manoyak, one of whose pieces will be played this afternoon, who runs Vox Electronica Festival every spring, this progressive musical scene receives the kind of public support that has allowed it to flourish because it represents a kind of internationalism and prestige for Ukrainian listeners. 
as with Andrejovic's swashbuckling performer, the intellectualism of contemporary music serves as something as of a heroic function in Lviv's audience, for Lviv's audiences, by allowing Ukrainians to access and participate in an elite international discourse. Andrejcik's survey of the role of the intellectual hero in Ukraine's post-independence literature presents another model for comparison to the changes in the country's orchestral programming, the ambassador to the West. More than providing a link for Ukrainian music to reach Western ears, the repertoire of Ukraine's orchestras can also be seen as a kind of platform for exposure of the music in w with which the, the West is less familiar. This repertoire includes works from other Eastern European countries and even further afield to parts of the Middle East and Central Asia. As a city whose geographical and historical placement has made it a long time site of intersecting cultures, the musical programming in Odessa has always tended towards diverse composers and works. The Odessa Philharmonic has long been an ensemble performing the works of composers from its neighboring regions. However, recent programs demonstrate a distinctive rise in the performance of, of these neighboring repertoires. Mm -hmm. The repertorial roster of the OPO has always maintained a presence of Greek composers, which are not performed in Kiev or Lviv, let alone by many Western orchestras. But the number of works of, by Turkish composers has increased, as has the representation of Slavic composers who are not well known in the West. Prior to 2014, there was only one performance of a single work by the Turkish composer Ulbi Chamal Erkin in 2010-11, while in 2015-16 and 16-17, we've seen performances of three and four different Turkish composers, respectively. Among the lesser-known composers that the OPO has given exposure is previously mentioned Benjamin Usopov, Gia Kancheli from Georgia, and Anatolia Shandorovas from Lithuania, all contemporary composers. Kancheli and Chandorovas only just passed away in 2019. Kiev, too, has positioned itself as a kind of mediator of international music. Since 2014, the orchestra has regularly programmed concerts in collaboration with the embassies or dipl other diplomatic institutions of various countries. The earliest of these partnerships occurred when, between Ukraine and Europe's most prominent musical centers, Italy, France, and Germany. Uh, however, during the past two seasons, Kiev has, is, is, has expanded these partnerships to provide exposure for the repertoires of Ukraine's neighbors, most recently Azerbaijan and Poland. It's not entirely clear what has inspired these changes. Many Ukrainians are adamant that the academic institutions, the established houses of musical power, have not responded at all to the events of 2014. As is often the case, though, distance can provide some clarity, and from here it seems Ukraine's public identity is shifting. What is certain is that even within Ukraine, the perception of a Ukrainianness as established through institutional musical performance has changed dramatically. However, progress is not a straight line. When the National Symphony Orchestra of Ukraine came to the United States in November of this year, they presented a severely under-advertised program of uh, Russian masters at the New Jersey Performing Arts Center. An event that caused a flurry of outrage within the Kiev musical circle circles. But there is a change. This year's programs in Ukraine featured more living composers, including Serhii Pilutikov and Leonid Rogovsky, Stankovich, and Ivan Teredenko, all of whom were performed at this festival, um, either today or tomorrow. Andreas Kavler has posed important questions about what a Ukrainian history means, tracing shifts in historiographic trends from ethno-national to multi-ethnic to transnational. Perhaps the version of Ukraine that is most visible art music institutions are presenting is a trans-ethnic and transnational space, as well as a cosmopolitan and intellectual center that can help to guide new approaches to understanding Ukrainian identity. Thank you. Mm -hmm.